so Exodus chapter 16, we're going to kind of just skim through 16, 17, and 18 as time provides, but um, I really just wanted to um, look at some, what I'm calling life lessons from Exodus, and some, some parallels that we can draw from, from, the, from the Israelites uh, during the beginning uh, of their wanderings from Egypt to the promised land. Um, so let's go ahead and, and take a look at that here. I wanted to say too, Sandy, uh, we, for Christmas, um, the Gravers gave us a little, um, it's, it's not a plaque, it looks almost like a uh, wooden crate, and they had put on there Brother Tom's verse about letting your light shine. And uh, we, we have that in our family room, and I see it every day. And uh, every day, just about every day, I think about Tom, and I'm reminded of that, that you know, admonition from the, from the Word of God that Tom would often remind us of. And so um, I think it's cool that even, even though Brother Tom's been in heaven for a while, that his influence is still um, working in our hearts. And that's just, that's just a testimony uh, to the fact that God uh, really used Brother Tom and, and uh, that Tom allowed God just to use him that way. So I just wanted to share that with you too. Uh, but Exodus chapter 16. Um, so the Israelites have been through some of the, some of the issues. Uh, they, they've, they've gotten out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They sang a song after they saw Pharaoh's army destroyed. And then they come to um, Mara or Mara. Uh, in chapter 15, which is a place of bitter water, and the people complained because there was no water to drink, and God provided uh, Moses a tree. He said, throw this tree in the water, and it'll make it drinkable, and so he did that, and they were able to drink uh, the water. And at the end of chapter 15, it says, they came to Elam, where were 12 wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. So God brought them to, to Merah, a place of bitterness and, and a, a place of trial and testing. Um, God reminded them that he would provide for them. He says these, this phrase in verse 26 of chapter 15. At the end of verse 26, he says, for I am the Lord. That phrase is found over and over in uh, the book of Exodus and, and Genesis and Exodus, where God is reminding his people that he is the Lord and that he's got everything under control. And then he brings them to a place called Elam at the end of chapter 15. Elam was a great place. There was, uh, as it says, there are 12 wells of water. That's a lot of, of water to choose from for the, for the Israelites. And three score and ten palm trees, 70 palm trees. And boy, that must have been like um, a resort compared to everywhere they've been to this point. So they loved it in Elam. But as you know, as you recall in the book of Exodus, uh, they would follow the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Remember that? And whenever that pillar would pick up and move, they would follow it. It was God's leading them through the wilderness. And so it moved on. In chapter 16, they're moving from this awesome place of comfort called Elam. This place that you would just want to stay. It's, it's almost like a vacation. And everything there was great. Shade, uh, abundance of what they would need in water, just a beautiful, beautiful resort. But then the cloud moved, and it was time to leave there. And nobody likes to leave uh, places like that, but it was time to move on. God had a plan. He was taking them somewhere. And we have to keep that in mind as well in our life, that our life is seasonal. And, and there's a, it's a beautiful picture of that in the wilderness wanderings, and even really all of the Israelites' history, they're a good example, a good picture of, of what our life, our individual life is. It's seasonal, it has testings and trials and good times and bad, all that kind of thing. Um, and so now they're being moved from this place of comfort and, and wonderful uh, accommodations. Chapter 16, and they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. Now, you know, it's not necessarily uh, that it's, it's a bad place. It's a sinful place. It's just the name of it, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation, the whole congregation, everybody was complaining. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, 
For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We're in uh, Exodus 16. And uh, so they're complaining again. God gets them out of this wonderful place of comfort. They come to the wilderness of sin and they start to complain again. Oh, it would have just been better. Aaron and Moses, they brought us out here to die. It would have been better if we would have just stayed in Egypt because we had food there. We had bread until we were full. And you brought us out here to kill us, to kill us with hunger. And uh, they, they were sure that Moses and Aaron were a bunch of clowns who had no idea what they were doing and just kind of winging it. Doesn't it look like that, though? If you're, if you're in the congregation, if you're in the children of Israel, and you've got Moses and Aaron it almost looks like they're winging it. They're just moving around. And yeah, you know the pillar is the presence of God. And yeah, you know you're supposed to follow it and that God's done some miraculous things. But man, are these guys just off their rocker? Are they really, do they really know what God's plan is? And man, they begin to complain. And so the Lord says to Moses in verse four, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people should go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So God says, I'm going to do something really strange. I'm not going to put you in a place of abundant vegetation uh, where you can make food. I'm not going to bring you to uh, this, uh, this area of land where there's going to be all kinds of cattle and herds and you'll have meat to the full. I'm going to do something really weird, something that, that you wouldn't expect and some of you are going to wonder what's going on. I'm going to make it rain bread. Bread's going to fall out of the sky and be on the ground when you wake up in the morning. Enough bread for you to eat every day. And I'm going to do this to try them, to show them, to hopefully instill confidence in them that I am the Lord and I'm going to provide for them. And uh, verse 5, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather, gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children, At even then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt, and in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening's flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses and, uh, spake unto Aaron, saying unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. <clears throat> so God is showing himself, he's proving himself to the people. They've come to bitter water, God gave them good water. Not only did he give them good water, he took them to a place of abundant water and shade and beauty. Then he brings them out of that and they get into the wilderness of sin and now they're afraid they're going to die of hunger. There's nothing to eat. And so God says, then I'm going to rain bread and give you quails and you're going to have bread to the full. And he says, you're going to start to look for me for your provision. Daily bread. You notice in there, and we're going to get into it in a second, he mentioned that on the sixth day you'll gather twice as much because on the Sabbath they weren't supposed to work, right? And so he said on the sixth day you gather the Sabbath day's food because the Sabbath day you don't need to be out gathering food. Daily bread. It wasn't a storehouse. There wasn't a Kroger. There wasn't a Walmart or a Sam's. It was every day you're going to trust that when you wake up there's going to be food for you. Just watch me. God said, just watch how I will do this. Um, I've been talking to Brother Sam um, Varghese a lot lately. As you understand, he's, he's going to be retiring. He'll be back in the States in June. So we've been kind of working some things out for when he does return. And just uh, hearing his heart as he wraps up his ministry there. And we've been emailing a lot lately. Just I'm trying to encourage him and, and, and help him to understand where we're working to get him uh, settled when he gets here. And some of the things he's relaying back to me about what he's seen God do when, since he's been there and how it's so hard to pull himself away from there and, and how you, you know, many of you know the stories of, of Brother Sam and, and what God brought him through for all those 43 years. 
Um, I've been reading biographies and books lately of seasoned Christians who testify of the faithfulness of God and the provision of God. And uh, we have a Bible full of experiences and evidence. We have lives of people that you and I can touch and talk to and, and FaceTime and sit across a table who have been through the ups and downs, the wilderness, if you will, the testings and the trials. And God said, go and I will prove you. Watch, I will make this work. And we have these testimonies, one after the other, of the faithfulness of God. And so I want to encourage us tonight in our faith that as we read through the word of God and we hear the testimony of, testimonies of those around us, to be reminded that we have a God, he, he is the Lord. He is watching every little detail. He doesn't forget. He didn't forget one morning to rain down manna. Every day there was food there. He never forgot it. And, and I, w I want us to be encouraged tonight that God is keeping his eye on us. He is the Lord of us too. And he knows what we need when we wake up in the morning. And what we need when we wake up in the morning is provided, isn't it? His mercies, they're new every day. He's faithful. He, what we need is, every, is there every morning because he's providing mercies and he is there with us. And so be reminded, be encouraged by this account. And they looked out in the wilderness and the Bible says in verse 10, they saw the glory of the Lord. And there are gonna be times in our lives when God will bring us to a place of testing and trial. And at the same time, in the di most difficult circumstances, we'll see his glory. We gotta be looking for it though. Did you see that Aaron had to call their attention to it? We have to be looking for it because it's, it's very easy, brothers and sisters, to get down in the dumps. I, 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 I'm just like you in these areas. It's very easy to get down in the dumps. But what we have to do is take our eyes off of that and look at the Lord. He's gonna, he's gonna show himself. He will. So verse 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh. Remember, we, would to God we were in Egypt and had the flesh, pot, flesh pots. And in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You can almost put an emphasis on the word I. I am the Lord. Not Egypt, not Pharaoh, not Moses, not Aaron. I am the Lord. I am the one who's going to provide for you. I am the Lord, your God. Verse 13, and it came to pass that at even the quails came up. God said it would. And it came to pass that, yep, here they came. And they covered the camp. Plenty of food to go around. And in the morning, the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that was lay uh, was gone, gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So they walked out of their tents and in the morning and they went what is it that's weird and Moses said hey what did God say he would do he said he would rain bread and when you woke up in the morning you would have your daily bread there it is huh there it is how many times are we surprised at the promises of God <laughs> you know he, he promised he's going to do something and when he does we're like whoa Man, he actually did it. Of course he did. Of course he did. And so they, they eat, or they get the manna. And I've, I think I've warned us before, gentlemen, do not tell your wife the food that she made is manna. I know that we think that's a flattery, but it's really not. Um, don't go to the dinner table and say, what is that? Not a good day. All right. So verse 16, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. 
gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And omer for every man. Now you know there were some guys, right? Who thought an omer wasn't enough, right? So they needed um, a couple omers, right? Um, if you got four, is it a grand slam, omer? Sorry, never mind. Uh, 17. And the, would you say? Yeah, what's the conversion factor there? And the children of Israel, 17, did, did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, let no man leave of it, leave of it till the morning. So don't leave it sitting around. Whatever you get, you eat. Don't waste it. Okay? He didn't want you to waste God's provisions. Right? We shouldn't waste God's provisions. Um, how many of you got in trouble for wasting food when you were a kid? You know? You know what I always heard? There's starving kids in Africa. And you're throwing this away. And my smart aleck comment was always, well, even if I eat all this, there'll still be starving kids in Africa. Anyway. Um, so Moses said, don't leave it till the morning. What do they do? Verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. But some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. So, he, he told them, look, don't leave the bread sitting around to the morning because if you do, it's going to not be good for you. And they're like, well, what if God forgets tomorrow? We have some in the pantry just in case. We took a couple omers extra. Or maybe I didn't eat as much as I could today and I'm saving it up because you never know. You I mean, you've seen how God's done things. I mean, one day it's this, the next day it's the other. It's bitter water, it's clean water. Maybe tomorrow he's going to forget or maybe he's going to get mad and change his mind or maybe Moses and Aaron are off the rocker. We better store some up just in case. What is that? That's worry. That is worry. God might not do it. What am I going to do if... If it's not there, what am I going to do if what I need doesn't really, what am I going to do if God doesn't come through? I know what I better do. I better save some just in case. Let, I better take care of this in case God forgets. I need to handle this because I'm not sure that God's really got, he doesn't really understand what it's going to take to keep us alive. And, and we understand the rationale. That it's worry. And what does worry do to us? Look at verse 20. It breeds worms and stinks. Not literally. But boy, worry does mess with us, doesn't it? It's almost like having something on the inside and that just is a cancer that eats through you and is gross and, and stinks and is decaying. Listen, worry Worry is one of those things that can decay our bodies physically and our minds and our spirits. Worry affects every bit of us. It really does. It, it, worry eats us from the inside out just like worms would eat that bread up if it was left around. Worry. Stop. Easy, right? Let's just stop worrying. <laughs> but man, there's a lesson right there. God's, God's going to handle it. And so what if God doesn't handle it? I have, let's say I've got um, no money in the bank. What if God doesn't handle this? I better do something about it. Steal or defraud somebody or lie. or Well, I, I'm sick, so I've got to do something about it. And I just... I'm going to sit around all night and, and just be in the dumps and not trust God and, and God's not going to come through for me. Or I, the, the, the options are endless of the things we worry about. But the point is, is worry does nothing but decays. It decays what God has provided. It, and, it, and it really is an offense to the Lord. And they gathered it every morning, verse 21, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, 
it melted. God provided for him every morning, said, go out and get your food. Once the sun got up and got hot out, the bread melted and it was gone. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to over-spiritualize some things here, but I think there could be a lesson about letting the day get away from us without meeting with the Lord. I don't want to be dogmatic about, you know, if you don't meet with the Lord in the morning, you know, you're not doing it right. I'm not saying that because I understand that, you know, so, as, as we meet, when we meet with the Lord, the fact that we meet with the Lord is the most important thing. I'm not denying that. But there's something about getting that daily bread when we start our day. Getting, getting God's heart and our heart on the same page. Getting in touch with him somehow. Connecting with God to some degree before the day gets beyond us, you know. And that doesn't mean you have to spend two hours, you know, in prayer and Bible reading. That, that may mean you spend 15 minutes talking to the Lord about your day and, and reading some verses of scripture to, to get your heart going in the morning. I don't know what it means, but I do, I, like I said, I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but I think we can say something about not letting the day get away with us before we've had our daily bread. All right, verse 22. And it came to pass on that sixth day, on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said to them, this is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that which ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept into the morning. And they laid it up to the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink. Neither was there any worm therein. Why? Because they were obeying. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Uh, and it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. So there's something for us too. Going out on the seventh day, look, look, seventh day on the Sabbath day. There is a very serious principle of rest for the human body. God intends for us to rest. He sure does. We are designed to rest for a day. <clears throat> yes, for the Israelites, it was twofold. It was to rest and to remember the Lord. And for us, the day of rest may be a Sunday, which is to rest and, and remember the Lord. But we have gotten into a, a mindset in our world, and this especially in the Western world, where if you're not busy you are somehow bad. If you're not doing something, you are wasting time. If you're not being productive, you're not a good citizen. You're not a good mom. You're not a good dad. Um, that's not how God designed us. God designed us to rest. In fact, some of the time, we're being a better dad or mom or whatever when we do take time to rest. I want to encourage you, if, if you're one of those people who, who can't, can't stop, it's probably going to catch up to you. Look at the principle here. Again, I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but I think we can draw some parallels. You see what happens? There went some people, 27, they went out on the seventh day. They went out to gather. They said, no, nah, I, don't, I don't need that. I, I, I need to go gather. And what did they find? Nothing. I think there's a lot of emptiness and overworking ourselves. I think there's a lot of emptiness and um, vanity to trying to stay busy for something when God has made us to rest for him and for our own health. And so, the, again, I, I'm not, don't, I'm not being dogmatic about that, but I think there's a principle there for us just to, to draw some conclusions with. Verse 28, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like unto coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. All right. Verse 32. 
And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. And the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. Now, so keep it as a testimony. Take an omer, put it in the Ark of the Testimony that we can remember someday when we're no longer eating manna, how good God was to us. Do you see that there? Do you see what God's saying? There's coming a day when the wilderness wanderings will be over and you'll no longer be going on the strength of a daily bread. There's coming a time where you will be brought to where I want you to be and you'll have everything you've ever needed or wanted. So in other words, you have a bright future. Don't, 40 years. It's a season. For, for this nation, it was just a season. 40 years, it's a season. Sometimes in our seasons of life, we're going to have to go through some stuff. But God's promises, God's future for us as believers is something incredible to look forward to. His promise will come true. He'll keep it. Sunday morning, we're going to look at, uh, we're starting a new series called The Final Four. It's March, right? So we're starting a series called The Final Four, and it's the final four events on the prophetic timeline. So we'll start with the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, and the millennial reign. And so this Sunday is going to be the rapture. And so it, we, as Christians, as safe people, we call it the blessed hope. Because it is, it is the main event for us. It is the, the catching away, the, the day we've all been waiting for, what we've been looking forward to. Saints for, throughout history have been waiting for. It's coming. God's promises are going to unfold. And you say, well, I, just, I think it would have happened by now. Me too. And, and it's easy to say, boy, I don't know. I just, <sighs> when's it going to happen? I don't know. Maybe it's not. We have an entire book that God keeps his promises up until this point in history. What, what's he going to stop now? No. Because we can go back and look at the testimony and see pot of manna, can't we? We can go back and see how God has provided every single step along the way and know that there's coming a day when this will all be a memory. We won't need daily bread because we'll be with the living word. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. In your holy word, Lord, I ask that you would uh, help us to learn these examples and, and these principles. Lord, I, we can see ourselves so well looking at the children of Israel is like looking at a mirror. And it's, it's condemning and it's, it's just a truthful look. But Lord, what I love about it is we see your mercy. We see your grace. We see your provision. And Lord, we thank you for these things because it does help build and boost, uh, booster our faith, bolster our faith. Lord, I pray that you would in, indeed do that uh, through your holy word this evening. I pray that you bless our time uh, together at Fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. 